Hi, this is Phil Hinton and welcome to our final video from CES 2012. Uh, we were last with you about two or three days ago with our Roundup 1. In this video, we're going to discuss the whole show, everything we've seen since the last time we saw you, as well as the negatives and uh, some of the positives, Steve. Um, so I guess we need to start with uh, Sharp 8K. Um, quite impressive. Yeah, I mean, I didn't realise they had an 8K display um, at CES until the guy on the stand told us, and both of us looked quite shocked, like, mm, you got an 8K t TV? So, um, yeah, obviously, there's, there's no 8K content. There, there's probably one 8K camera in the world, I guess. Um, NHK, it looks like, like it was NHK to the footage because it was um, there were some shots of Tokyo. Uh, and I have to say, I had, a, I had a surreal moment because the shot they, they had was very similar to the view from my apartment when I lived in Tokyo. And for a second, I was almost thought I was looking back through my window again. The, the clarity was so incredible. Everything we ever see is of Tokyo. You yeah. always say, <laughs> I used to live there. That was my apartment. Well, but Gets born after a while, Steve. You know. Anyway, but in terms of clarity and so on, yeah. there's a space shuttle launch. launch. Um, the fine detail in the rockets, uh, the side booster rockets, and and even the small amounts of smoke underneath the main fuel tank. Yeah. Um, detail I'd never ever seen before. Uh, that that was quite quite spectacular. I mean, obviously this is just a prototype. They're just showing what they're capable of, and, and it's, there's no way this is ever. You know, there's no intention to release this anytime soon or in the next couple of years probably but uh, you know certainly the potential's there and, and, and I get this feeling that increased resolution is the way we're going in terms of uh, image image rather than 3D or something like that it's resolution that's going to be playing the, I think partly because numbers sell and if in, in the C, in the old CE business you know big numbers are easier to sell than other, some other things well you don't have to wear silly glasses well, for a start a so I mean that, that's going to be a big thing for for the public out there who don't like to to look uh, silly when they watch the TV, basically. <laughs> they like I to mean, watch TV through sunglasses. I mean, yes, you're in your own living room, you know, you, you're not in public, but at the same time, you still look like a prat wearing shutter glasses and, and you know, so on. Unless you get a nice pair of designer passive glasses like to Like the use ones with. we've got from LG. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but even then, we still look like idiots sitting at home wearing glasses. So the public don't like that. I mean, 3D it has advanced a little bit uh, in terms of the glasses 3 stuff. Still not there though, it's still using 50 year old tech and no matter how much development they seem to be putting into it, it you still have to stand at an exact spot with your yeah. head straight onto the display, you can't move your head anyway otherwise you lose the effect and um, the only way around that is is basically to drop the resolution. We saw one from TCL which is going to be an advertising uh, display which the, the 3D effect, really impressive. You can notice it wherever you're standing, jumping out the screen. Yeah, there's a lot of negative parallax in that stuff. Yeah, but there was there was no resolution there, so it was, what, maybe 480 yeah, lines if we're lucky. Yeah, lines, yeah. Um, and I, we did get some close-ups for you in one of the videos there to have a look at the, the resolution, it, and that's from about two or three feet back, and it's still, you know, you can really notice a loss. Whereas Toshiba, nice resolution in detail but no 3d effect unless you're absolutely at the right yeah and they, were, they were using a, a 4k panel which gave, gave them additional resolution to get good resolution on the 3d but there were black footprints on the three sets of black footprints on the floor so showing you where exactly to stand in order to get the 3d effect which gives you an idea of how li limited the viewing angles are going to be on this tv um, but even when you stood in exactly the right spot there just wasn't the depth of that image it was not good 3d i mean compared yeah. to what you'll see with an active shot or even a passive display um, there wasn't the depth there at all. It, you, it was in three dimensions, but you know you didn't think, oh wow, that's 3D. It, it was very, very mediocre. I mean, 3D uh, this year very much been treated like the the ginger step, step child. It's it's incredible. It's like, last year it was just 3D everywhere, nothing but 3D. Yeah. This year you would almost you would be hard put to. I mean, the only company that was really showing any three or signs for 3D and 3D content was LG, and obviously they have the advantage because they're, they're using passive. You can put a pair of glasses on and look at any of their TVs and see 3D. But even Panasonic, you know, the biggest proponent of actually showed 3D yeah. there is, had almost. I, I didn't see any 3D displays actually. I, not I'm, with actual glasses. I'm thinking back to to the show floor to the to the stand, and I can only remember seeing one setup with the 3D glasses. Yeah. That's that's all I can remember, and it was on the gaming area. I don't remember seeing it for movies and that kind of thing. Now, it could just be that manufacturers now regard 3D as a feature and when we go out and buy a new TV in the next year or so that um, whatever TV we buy, it's going to it's gonna be 3D ready whether you want it or not and it's going to be up to us to buy the glasses to use that. But um, it seems like the manufacturers, after, after having spent billions, and, and really they have spent billions <laughs> in R&D and so on, 
I've just forgotten about it and just written it off as a bad idea. And when we were at the sharp stand, once again, there was no displays for 3D at all. And I actually asked the guy, I said, you know, uh, are you not promoting 3D? He goes, look, it's, it's a feature now. Um, it hasn't been the success that we'd hoped it was. And as far as we're concerned, higher resolution is the way forward. Yep. And I think that's, that's pretty much the case. Yeah, but obviously high resolution is the way forward, but we don't have any playback device yet for, for that kind of content. Yep. Um, very slowly we're starting to see Hollywood move from, from uh, scanning at 2K to 4K. We're seeing a lot of 4K cameras being used in production now, like uh, Peter Jackson with The Hobbit okay. using the Red Epic. Um, so that's going to come online. So they were kind of stuck this year, I think, Steve, between um, 3D, we don't want 3D anymore, or 3D is a feature now and, and we can't keep selling mm -hmm. the f a feature that the public don't want. But they couldn't really jump to 4K because the content's not there yet. So we're kind of stuck in the middle. So the thing that they have gone with this year is Google TV and Smart TV and those kinds of smart services, which um, I've never found interesting. Yeah, I mean, clearly the manufacturers are hoping to turn the television into sort of the cent digital hub of your, of your home. Um, and I can understand why they would want to do that. Personally, like you, Phil, I've, I just want to watch TV and you know, movies on, yeah. on my TV. I'm not interested in Skyping my friends or Twittering. or I've got a computer for all that. Uh, and so I, I understand what they're doing. I know why they're doing it. And maybe to the younger generation, that's something they genuinely want. Um, but personally, yeah, I've just, just produced quality TVs that produce a good image. That's all I really want. Well, I'm thinking at the minute how many devices I have uh, with me here where I can Twitter, where I can Skype, where I can go on Facebook and update my profile if I want to, to do that. I don't need the TV. I've got my mobile phone, I've got a tablet, I've got a laptop. <laughs> uh, you know, we've got the devices already on us. Wherever you, see, wherever you go, you, you, if you've got a smartphone, you can stay in touch and stuff. So I really don't see why you would want that in your smart TV. Now, video on demand, I could perhaps yeah, that, that live with that. that. But, but at the minute, you know, looking at the UK and the bandwidth in the UK for broadband, it takes forever for stuff to stream down. BBC iPlayer, I mean, a lot of the BBC iPlayer uh, applications that I've tested and uh, TVs that we've had in for review, uh, playback around about 6 p.m. at night to about 10 p.m. at night, really choppy because everybody wants to be online, everybody wants to be watching uh, iPlayer, and it, it never seems to work right. So, yes, smart TV is the big thing here, but I think it's really a, it's a stopgap between you know, 3D being a failure and the mo progressing over to higher resolution to 4K. It's the only reason I can see it. It's the only way I can see them taking display technology forward is, is to go with the resolution and not 3D. Yeah, I mean, the only perhaps the aspect of smart TV that is useful is probably content sharing around your home. Maybe that, that's good, but uh, you're right, Phil. They definitely seem to be placing an awful lot of emphasis on, on, on smart TV this year because they really don't have much else to sell us at the moment. <laughs> yeah. I mean, one of the smart features I did see moving away from televisions um, for a second was a Grace Note stand. Uh, we went over and spoke to Graham over at, at Grace Note, and they were showing a, a new technology called uh, Habu, um, which you can have on your mobile phone and on your tablet or on your laptop, um, and hopefully soon uh, in your car uh, with the new head units where you can attach your iPod uh, and then use the application to choose the mood that you're in when you want to listen to music. And I don't know if anybody else out there is like me, but I have my, my iPod in the car. Um, I have it on random, I have it on shuffle, and more times out of, you know, <laughs> it goes from one, more, end it goes from one extreme totally to the other, yeah. uh, especially if it's my, my iPod, you know, the, the choice of music, <laughs> just, so depending on the mood that you're in, I usually find myself skipping through the tracks to find something I want to listen to, and that could be every, every other track I'm skipping through and maybe mm. skipping through nine or ten pieces of music before I find something else. And it can get annoying on a long road trip or whatever, unless you switch yourself off and just listen to whatever. But if you're in a particular mood, like you're driving on the motorway and, and you know you want to cause carnage, you know, put put in that we want to cause carnage and play us heavy rock and <laughs> fast dance tracks and that kind of thing. It makes sense to me to to put your mood in. You know, you were your lady, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you want to get romantic, you can press romantic, and it's going to play you back Barry White. Yeah, no, it's, it seems like a, a, an excellent solution to the problem of having tens of thousands of songs on your hard drive and never being able to decide what to listen to. If you use mood as a, as a determinant, then uh, yeah, it, it, it makes sense to me. I actually think it's quite a good idea. So Steve, talking about new technology out there, I mean, we always seem, see robots 
um, at these shows. You know, it's, there's never a CES goes by where you don't see some new robot. And, and there's some really quite impressive uh, technology out there. We saw one who was called uh, Marata Boy. Um, and basically this was a, a medical company, a medical technology company, uh, who'd put gyros and all sorts of things into this little yeah. robot on the bike. And he was able to stay on the bike and balance because of the gyro yeah. and, and so on. And he was able to move backwards and forwards and... Cycle uphill. Cycle uphill. And he was also able to shut himself down uh, and use less power mm. uh, when he was not being used. And obviously that technology is now moving across the TVs, uh, like the Sony TVs that detect when you're not in the room, yeah. switch themselves off and that kind of thing. So that was really interesting. Uh, also for, for those of us um, who don't like housework, <laughs> I think that goes for most of the male population. Um, robot cleaners, not a new thing, but it's interesting to see how over the last sort of 10 years that kind of technology has developed to where you can just leave it now and, and it'll go out and it'll clean the room and it'll actually do a really good job. But it, you know, it'll get into the, the little nooks and yep, crannies yep. And, and do a good job and then go back and charge itself up. Um, still quite expensive technology, but nice to see um, that that's there. Now, the other one that I didn't get was air purifier. And I actually spoke to the lass on the stand and I said, <laughs> why is it mobile? And she said, well, you know, uh, you could have somebody smoking in the dining room and it'll go in there by itself and clear the air out and then move someone else where it detects that there's a smell, an odour or, or, or something like this. Obviously for the Americans with their huge homes with, yeah. you know, various rooms and all the rest of it, because I can't see that working in the UK. But in the UK, we, we all tend to live in, in quite compact houses. I mean, even, you know, uh, the majority of us even live, living in new homes, there's always a downstairs and an upstairs unless you're living in a bungalow. And the one thing that these things don't <laughs> do is fly. They, they haven't yet mastered the art of the stairs. So yep. I, I don't see much um, usefulness in, in that one. Um, useful for the Americans, you know, with their big houses. Which tend to be on one level. Which tend to be on one level, yeah. Um, and then there was an interesting robot, which we're going to show you a clip of now, because we thought it was absolutely hilarious. Um, now, this wasn't a robot. This was a guy in a suit playing <laughs> a robot, but he was absolutely brilliant. He was there most of the day yeah. entertaining the crowds. And take a look at this. <laughs> That's right, Christian. Mega cool. Uh, whoa. Hello. Uh, how are you doing? I haven't seen you here before. What's your name? I'm Laura. Laura. I don't have Cody's Wait, shake it. Ah, yeah. That's right, Laura. I'm going to take a picture with you, Bob. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, that's right. Mm. Oh, that's right. Fun and playful look. I like it. <laughs> Please, take six pictures. <laughs> Laura, pay attention. Focus, focus, Laura. Okay, it's creepy. I, I, I mean, I, I, I don't want to stereotype. I don't want to stereotype. That's rude. I know, that's horrible. It's not like me at all. Because when I saw you, I felt like we had this connection. Oh, uh, you, you know it, girl. I definitely love Laura. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that was robots, quite interesting. Another interesting thing I just want to touch on quickly uh, because I am a big fan of the DeLorean DMC-12. <laughs> and uh, I think we spent most time, more time taking uh, insert shots of, of the car than anything else. It was one of the most popular stands <laughs> of, uh, on the whole show. People, a car that failed when it came out originally, yeah. but I guess partly because of the movie. Uh, yeah. yeah, it was incredibly popular. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, it's it's an electric car, so um, well, you can do one point twenty one gigawatts. gigawatts. <laughs> yeah, 
And uh, what else can we think of? Yeah, has it got enough juice to get yeah, up to 80 eight, eight miles, miles an hour? hour? Flux capacitor is optional, obviously. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it was it was good to see the car there. Now, it, I mean, in all honesty, it was a it was a failure when it was launched. It's never been a reliable car. Uh, but there's a company in Texas now who, over the last few years, they have been uh, they've been working with owners um, to update the cars with spare parts and so on. But from 2013, uh, they're actually going to start producing them again from. Um, old chassis and, and so on because they have the presses for pressing new parts, new body panels and so on. Um, really quite interesting, going to cost you an awful lot of money if you want an electric one. Um, but I thought that was interesting and to me I, I still think that car looks futuristic. Even now it still looks futuristic, particularly with the, with the battery in the back, it, it had a very futuristic look to it. And um, yeah, no, I've never actually seen a DeLorean up close so uh, it was quite cool. Yeah, it was quite cool to see how badly the panels <laughs> lined up. It was a dog. <laughs> <laughs> No wonder it failed. <laughs> yeah, but still, we see one driving down the street, which is a very, very rare sight these days. You know, everybody still stops and looks at mm. DeLorean with the gull wing doors and so on. So that was interesting. Um, another bit of new technology. Well, it's not really new technology because the, the 3D Fury's been out for a while, uh, which does kind of the same thing. And that's 3D Now uh, with their 3D Now box. And it was just a little box. Yeah, about, literally about that big. But it's so, so big. And, and it does all the, the processing inside for the different uh, formats of 3D and then it outputs uh, the signal to the TV yeah. via HDMI and as long as your TV uh, can do 60 to 120 hertz and has an HDMI input, has an HDMI input then, then it will work with 3D and obviously the better the refresh rate the better the result you're going to get using RF 3D glasses Yeah, the same kind of uh, glasses as M Monster make um, uh, and on Optoma as well, the Optoma projectors little RF uh, transmitter, you can put it anywhere, it hasn't got to be in line of sight um, and, you know, it, 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 for those of you who have a, a, t a 2D TV and don't want to buy a new TV and perhaps you, you love your TV and don't want to change it, um, it's a way of option of, of, of adding 3D to it. It yeah. uh, wasn't cheap, though, to be fairly honest. No, I, I mean, I, I expected it to be about $299. Mm. Um, Two ninety nine dollars. It was actually five ninety nine. And that's just for the processor. And that's just you know, for the one hundred and seventy nine yeah. for the uh, what they call the starter kit, which is a pair of glasses and the transmitter. So if you get two pairs of glasses and the transmitter and and the processor, you're looking at around about eight hundred dollars. So in the UK, it could be five six hundred quid. Which you know you could buy a three D TV for that. So so is it you know is it really viable from a cost perspective? I'm not so sure. But we'll be looking forward to get one of those in and just try it out and see how it works. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm interested to see how it works. I mean, we've both got Pioneer Kuros, which, you know, getting on for four year old now, three four year old. So it'll be interesting to see if you could turn, you know, your your yeah. reference TV in your living room into into a three D TV that actually works. Mm. Um, still going to look like a prat wearing the glasses though. That's the only <laughs> thing. So that's the the three D now processor. Really quite an interesting bit of technology. We will get in and we will test it and see what it's like. And I guess Steve. Uh, year two for you. Yep, year two for me. Yeah. Year, year six for me. <laughs> your old hand now, aren't you? Old CES yeah. hand. And I, I've got to say, you know, coming over here this year, I, I was expecting a different show to what we actually got. I thought we were going to see a lot more of 4K. I thought we were going to see some kind of announcement on a playback device or some kind of technology that's going to get 4K in the home. Maybe that's for next year. Maybe we were expecting a little, or maybe I was expecting a little bit much coming into this show and it reminded me very much of the show last year where uh, more evolution than revolution yeah. in terms of product I mean um, I've been lucky I've seen some of the big stories breaking here like HD DVD pulling out of the market Blu-ray getting a foothold the uh, we've seen launch. things with Kuro launch I mean that demonstration with the the ring in midair and that kind of thing we've not really had any of that kind of technology but then again we are coming out of a recession period quite a long recessionary period from 2008 to now uh, but the thing that I think is turning the tide is visit numbers definitely up this year I mean, it's for been, me it, I could tell a big difference yeah it's, the been, year it's been really busy this year I mean even usually it's the Thursday the Friday uh, of the show that's really busy and then the Saturday and the Sunday not so busy because people go home for the weekend this year the shows run during the week from the Tuesday to the Friday uh, and, difference in and the thing. Tuesday to the Thursday, really busy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, everybody went on the show floor. There was lots of people there. It was really difficult to get in and film anything, and to film interviews. It's been a complete been nightmare, a nightmare. <laughs> with people walking in front of the camera and all sorts. And uh, Friday was the only day that it tended to be a little bit quieter. We went to South Hall on on the Friday, and it was a little bit quieter. Yeah. But in terms of numbers, it's a, been a record-breaking year, year for CEA, uh, with the CES show. 
Um, so, you know, they've had over 150,000 attendees over yep. the four days, uh, over 30,000 international attendees, including us two. Um, <laughs> So that's a huge number of people that come in here. I mean, this is the show you've got to do. If you're going to do any show of of, of the year, you have to do CES. Yeah. Uh, it's the biggest show. It's got the most manufacturers. It's got uh, the most representatives uh, of the companies here. If you want to do business, if you want to see the product, uh, or like us, you want to report on the product, or see what the product line is going to be for the year. I mean, I find it really useful um, from planning out our reviews, reviews yeah. for the year, you know, we know what's coming, we know roughly when it's going to be coming, so we can plan out our calendar and so on. So it's definitely the show to do. I mean, we have nothing like it in Europe. You can't even comprehend the size of it until you've been here. We're talking about 1.8 million square feet of ex exhibitions, over 3,000 exhibitors, 20,000 new products launched. I mean, it's just staggering the scale. Uh, and when we're you know, trying to cover just the two of us, yeah. it's not easy. <laughs> no, we, di we, we did uh, promise some audio uh, coverage this year. And to be honest with you, we failed miserably because yeah. we couldn't get out of Central Hall. Um, just the time uh, that you have on the show floor, trying to get everything done, trying to get all the major products covered, trying to get as much information as we possibly can. And of course, that's been really frustrating this year. The likes of Samsung. Um, maybe not so much LG, but definitely Samsung. Panasonic wouldn't tell us a thing. Yeah, uh, uh, even Sharp were a bit cagey about it. When we asked about the number of local dimming zones, I mean, they're, yeah. they're proprietary, they wouldn't say anything. I was very disappointed in the manufacturers not releasing it. You think the whole point of this show is to advertise your wares, yeah. as LG were doing very well, I have to say. Um, whereas other ones, they wouldn't give you, I mean, Samsung in particular, would not give us any specifications about the TVs at all, which made, you know, doing reports on them quite difficult because we had no idea what the specifications were. Um, so, Steve, impressive show, impressive size. It really is um, the show to do. And even though it's there's been nothing really revolutionary this year, um, it's still worthwhile coming out here and oh, doing yeah, it. And it's still worthwhile talking about it and, and, and feeding the information back yeah, to the yeah. forums. I mean, like you say, Phil, it's the biggest show of the year. It's the only, it's, if you're going to do one show, this is the one you do. And then you know, all the new products for, for this year are shown. And it gives us a great idea of what to expect. And then, you know, even though we, we're saying we're a little bit disappointed in some respects, there are some great things coming down the line. I mean, certainly the OLED TVs look spectacular. I mean, obviously, we, that's a judgment based upon the show floor. We'll have to wait till we get them in for review. But, you know, I can't, for one, I can't wait to get my hands on an LG or, 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 or a Samsung OLED. Uh, and, and by the way, congratulations to LG who won product of the show with their 55 inch OLED. So yeah, a well big done. congratulations to George and the gang. Yeah. Um, very deserved. It looks spectacular. Um, but yeah, I mean, th there is definitely some very cool stuff coming down the line. And, and so there's not, you know, even though we were a bit disappointed, um, I, I don't, don't get us wrong, there's still some very interesting products coming out in 2012. Well, it's, it's like everything. We've got to be balanced in our coverage um, and, and tell you absolutely everything is going on. So you're up to speed as we are. And there, while there are negatives there, Steve, I, I think the positives far outweigh them. Fantastic show. Some excellent products are going to be a really, really exciting year uh, for TV stuff. Certainly, for from a review point of view, um, we've definitely gonna get the the LG OLED uh, that has been confirmed. Second half of the year, as soon as it's available, we will have that in for testing. Um, unfortunately, Samsung haven't told us anything, so we don't even know if their uh, OLED is going to be available this year. If it is. We will we, get it. We in. assume so, but no yeah. indication of any launch date or certainly no indication of any pricing, although I think we can assume both those TVs will not be cheap. No, the, I mean, you're talking eight to ten grand, yeah, definitely, for that. But then again, if you look back to the old days HD TV, when it was in its infancy, you know, the first plasma TVs and it, uh, LCD TVs that came on the market, you know, the proper flat TVs moving away from CRT, you were paying ten grand for a Pioneer back then. You were paying ten grand for a Panasonic back then. So... We're going to see that price level. However, I think this time around, you're going to see that uh, be eroded very quickly. Maybe in two years, you will see that price eroded. If you eroded. look at the way the price, um, the price margin for the 3D was eroded, within less than a year it had gone from being a, you know, uh, a high-end yeah, product. But, to yeah, but OLED's going to be a lot more. Oh, well, hopefully, so, so it's yeah. going to keep its margins. You know, that's what they're looking for, to keep the margin for this quality product. it's expensive to make it the most. Probably, it's expensive it? it's to make as well. Make. So uh, don't expect a cheap OLED in the next three years, but it will erode. It will come down to uh, more manageable uh, price points, I would imagine. You know, you're going to yeah. be paying... Yeah three or four grand maybe in a few years time for one of them um highlight of the show now my highlight of the show i had to think long and hard about this uh, between the, the lg oled and the sony crystal led tv now 
the honorary mention goes to the Sony Crystal LED TV. I thought that was fascinating technology. Yeah, me too. Um, absolutely stunning picture quality. It's not finished. It was a prototype. There were some issues with the image. Um, if you use the camera, uh, we could see how the refresh rate was working and so on, how, how the panel was working, which looked awful on the camera. I mean, we had to... Yeah, it didn't look like that when you were watching no, it in no. flesh, but on the camera it did appear. But certainly, you know, an interesting, an incredibly interesting approach to creating an image using yeah. individual LEDs for each pixel, uh, and 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 a beautiful image, uh, and certainly a, a product or, or technology to keep an eye out in the future. Definitely, I don't think it's going to be cheap. Just just no. with the, the way that the technology <laughs> it definitely works, definitely isn't going to be cheap. It's not going to be cheap. However, you know, Sony like to go their own way with things. They're a bit like Philips in that that respect, where they like to go and do their own thing. Um, and obviously there was no pre-show hype about this TV. I mean, we didn't know about right. it until press day, until yeah. press, press launch. Um, so we had it over there, had a look thinking, mm, not really sure about this, <laughs> not really sure how it works and so on. Uh, but once you see it, once you understand we the were, technology we behind away, it, we? yeah, uh, absolutely blown away. So that's my honorary mention. Um, my favorite product of the year was the LG OLED. Um, I looked at the Samsung very closely, looked at the LG very closely. And for me, it was just the, the desi actual design of the L LG. I just thought it looked like something that, that, that looked a million dollars hanging on the wall. Yeah, you know, just, absolutely. Just the, the, the bezel design um, and the picture quality, absolutely fantastic. I mean, proper black level, proper dynamic range, lots of shadow detail in there. Now it was content that they'd shot for the show you know we weren't seeing any film clips and so on and we will really need to test that when the product finally comes to market but for me um the lg oled gets product of the year from ces definitely yeah i'm with you phil i i, I was very impressed first of all you know they were there with the product they're actually going to launch you know they, they'd been waiting for three years for this now yeah. they finally delivered it was 55 inch a nice big screen oled um, it worked. It looked fantastic. It was a gorgeous design, you know. And they were selling it. I mean, you know, with so much other technology that was being shown, but with no indication of it actually being launched. OLED were there at the show with all their products lined up, all the specifications. Yeah. Um, you know, they were there. To, they were there to sell products, and that's what you want to see from a manufacturer. So for me, um, LG were the star of the show. Actually, another disappointment for me, Steve. Just to wrap this up a little bit here is that um, one of the disappointments for me certainly having seen it for the first time, having heard all the hype about it, was the Sharp Elite TV. Now, don't get me wrong, really nice TV, nice big screen size, some of the images looked really, really good. Uh, fair black levels on there, very good black levels for, for an LED yeah, TV. Yeah, and they were showing it in a dark room. Which it was credit, shown in a dark room. good conditions. Um, but I just, for me, I just didn't get it. I didn't get the where, where all this hype's come from. Now, it could just be that there's satisfied owners out there, and I've heard claims it's better than the Pioneer Kuro, it's better than the Panasonic plasma TVs in terms of black level shadow detail and so on. I didn't see that. I just didn't see that with it. And with 3D, I found the 3D really quite disappointing. Yeah, yeah, I, there was definitely something not quite right about the 3D in terms of the uh, the depth. Was You could tell it wasn't quite right. Um, it, it almost seemed like it was slightly confused at times. Mm -hmm. Maybe that was because there was some sort of frame interpolation going on within yeah. that image. Yeah. Um, but as you say, Phil, I mean, it was an attractive TV, it, but it, it seems like one of those TVs that, that, that are made to claw back some margin. You know, they, they say they use a top 5% hand-picked hand um, components. Uh, you know, it, you basically then you rack up the price. Mm. Um, but what the guy at the sharp stand told us was you can get almost all that technology that's in the uh, Elite from their Series 9 anyway, yeah. without paying the premium. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, it doesn't have THX on the Series 9, but if you get a calibrated the calibrator, you're going to have a great picture. I really like the Series 8, which didn't have any auto dimming. I was just about to say that. <laughs> I was just about to say that, you know, the best picture on, on the sharp stand was the Series 8 because it wasn't lo using uh, local dimming technology with a, with a full array backlight. Um, it had a full array, array backlight, yeah. it just didn't have the, the different Local zones. zones. Uh, and because of that, there was no halo. Yeah. Um, it it kind of reminded me of an old CCFL uh, LCD TV, which, you know, the uniformity is usually pretty good compared to the edge LED. Uh, yeah, yeah, lovely uniformity. It had an ambient light filter. I, I thought it had a really good image. I was genuinely, yeah, I was, the, yeah. the blacks looked pretty good yeah. on that TV. And, you know, I'd, I'd really like to get one in for review. That looked yeah. impressive. And big, big screen to 80 inches, went up to 80 inches. Yeah. It's a big old telly. So as you can see, I mean, CES this year, again, it has been TV driven. It has been display driven. Uh, we've done our best to try and 
uh, find other little products that were of interest, like the the joke holographic TV. <laughs> I mean, I mean it, that's going to be used for advertising. There's no way you're going to have that in the home. It needs a tunnel yeah. for it to work, a black tunnel. It was for using it to lasers work. and I think planes of glass at various yeah, intervals to yeah. create the depth. Uh, you know, it's meant for advertising. It's not a, a consumer product at all. We were just taking a look at a curiosity, really. Yeah. Um, so some interesting products, um, some genuinely nice products coming to market this year, which uh, we're desperate to get our hands on, uh, to test them, review them, and then let you guys know um, from, a, from a point of view of uh, objective review and what we think of them. Mm. And um, I guess that wraps it up for another year, Steve. I mean, it's been a long show. We've done 40, <laughs> 47 yeah, videos, 48 videos. Um, yep, yeah, some of them have been a little bit short because there's not been a great deal to talk about, but we'd rather bring you a short video with shots of the product so you can get to see what we get to see um, rather than just sending out a tweet of 140 characters. Uh, I think there's, there's more value in actually yeah. showing, you, showing you the product, even if it's only a 60 second video. I still think uh, there's some value in that. So hopefully you've enjoyed our coverage this year. We've certainly enjoyed bringing it to you, even though we're like zombies now. I mean, this is now <laughs> Sunday. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we still haven't recovered from the show. I went to sleep in my clothes the other night <laughs> because I was bus so busy editing videos. Uh, it's been a good laugh. It's been a good, good, uh, good show. Yeah, and uh, we hope you've enjoyed our coverage. So we'll catch you again very soon. <laughs>